So I just came from another online session where we really struggled to get students engaged, even though this from the beginning of the term had been the explicit goal of many of our sessions and including and especially this one where they were given ahead of time a specific task and told that they would have to present something to the class in the online environment based on that task. It was only one minute. It wasn't anything particularly academic or challenging. So they, the bar was low. They had a lot of time to prepare, but still here's what I observed that it was key to do as the facilitator of such sessions. The first thing of course is I had to be very emotionally intelligent. Not only did I have to be aware of my own feelings, for example, there are many things that the students did that I found inappropriate or frustrating or, or perhaps even a bit juvenile. I also had to be upfront with speaking about my emotions because I also saw that there wasn't a lot of room in the student's mind for speaking about how they felt about the topic or how they felt about the subject matter, even when explicitly asked. So even when I would give them a certain bit of information, facts or perspectives about the, the day's topic and ask them to respond, they were very unsure and wanted to restrict their comments to a judgment, what they think is right or wrong or what would be appropriate to say. Again, merely then rather answering the question, which was, what do you think? Or how does hearing that information make you feel? I... I say that the first thing that we must do as educators is to demonstrate emotional intelligence. And part of that, as I said, being aware of our own and providing the language, means and mechanisms and space to talk about them. Because again, we have to reckon with the fact that many of our students by this time have spent the past 10 years in an environment, what I call a 2D communication environment. So much of their communication is two-dimensional. They're either communicating asynchronously through a video or communicating asynchronously through responding to a video or something that they've seen or post in social media. The words, as we know, in social media, as they're typed, often lose a great deal of their meaning. So even if there's sarcasm or irony or comedy, even if you want to say something is bad, not meaning bad, but bad meaning good, all of those things are very easily lost in social media to the extent that students are overly cautious about expressing themselves. They always imagine there's a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. So I've really found that both setting those expectations for an emotional uh, competency within that space becomes one of the most crucial ways that we can demonstrate positive, mature behavior as an educator in the classroom. And so again, in addition to that first point of building in an emotional intelligence as part of whatever your content is, is also sharing the expectations for engagement. So even in a classroom that's physical now and face-to-face -face, and certainly online, what actually do we mean by engaging? Like what are some of the ways that students can engage? So of course I go through them um, about ways that they can use their microphones or cameras to engage, that they can raise their hand in the classroom or perhaps even just jump in if they feel that, they're, that they would like to interject. I also remind them that they can use the chat function. Even if we're engaging with others about the topic that you can also respond in real time in the chat area, raise a question, something for clarification, add your perspective, or even just to say that, yes, I understand or I agree. Like we do in real life conversation, we would we might not or just say, mm-hmm, uh-huh. And that lets the other people know that we're both following, that we're paying attention, not that we agree, but that we understand. And this becomes a crucial feedback loop that we don't get in the online environment, but then also that we need in order to more effectively communicate. Again, that translates to the classroom, the physical environment, where sometimes we have to help students put away their digital gadgets. For example, I was in a session this past weekend with students who had been newly admitted, and we were sitting just at a table, no further than we are now, and we were talking. 
And the goal of the session was to talk. I even wrote this on the board. Right now, we're going to talk about some ideas. We're going to discuss them, take different people's perspectives, and then we're going to see if we can come up with a consensus. Even as we sat at the table face-to-face, most of the students physically had their phones in their hands. And even when sort of talking, answering a question or sharing their perspective, I remember one student in particular, he kept sort of just like looking at his phone and feeling it. And I thought, he genuinely has something to say, pretty confident in it, but he literally can't put his phone down. He, he, he can't put it down. Like he can't just put the phone down. <laughs> and I wanted to say something about it. I wanted... And I guess the only thing that I want to say here is that when when it comes to the classroom and sharing our expectations, increasingly, I have to explicitly tell students how to use their mobile devices and other gadgets in the classroom. So yes, sometimes at one extreme, I'll say, we're going to have a low-tech classroom. We're going to have pencil and paper, anything that you'll need to know permanently or write that we'll, you'll be able to write it down i'll even help you along with taking notes but so much of what we're doing will depend on your engagement both in your listening to others when they're speaking and as well engaging and to, in order to do that you need to be present that means that there need not be a physical screen sitting between you and i there need not be a physical phone on the table potentially distracting others so even if my phone is on the table in front of me vibrating flashing It isn't just that it's distracting me, but even others who can see it, it's also distracting them. And so I have to take responsibility for that and put my phone away, put it on silent, or as I often do, put the phones in in somewhere in the room away that they can all see them and say, hey, our gadgets are over there and we're over here doing this. And inevitably someone will forget to turn their gadget off or put it on silent. And we all have to deal with the fact that now we're all distracted because someone has turned their, someone is buzzing, pinging away. I feel like it's important to give students that space to be away from their gadgets in a low tech environment when possible. Because remember so much of the time and even the activities that we give them to do is spent using technology such that really, I oftentimes have students who come to my physical classes without anything to write with, a pen, a paper. And while I can take upon the idea that there are many students who will want to use their their tablet to take notes, they don't even have the discipline to turn off the other notifications such that they can just use the tablet as a tablet. And unless you're willing to go through all of those ways and help students understand all of the ways that they need to give themselves the opportunity to focus, then I would say your best bet is to just have a low-tech classroom, bring extra pens and paper yourselves because you can depend on that most of them won't have it. (laughs) And worse, they're so awkward that they won't even ask to borrow a pen or a pencil or a piece of paper from any of their classmates sitting around them, even if they can see someone sitting there with the 500, you know, <laughs> page notebook, they'll just sit there and they, you ask them to pull out pen and paper, you get yours, and they, they literally don't have that skill and they want you to solve it for them. Like they literally don't have the ability to figure out how to get a pen and paper, just one piece of paper in a classroom. And I say that it's important back to the one of, being emotionally intelligent as a teacher to contend with your own feelings. Because I remember having found myself in that instance um, over the past 10 years in teaching in university classrooms where you show up at a classroom and literally no, no one has brought anything to write with. And I remember one student, he, you know, he had a backpack, he had his mobile phone. He's like, oh, I'm just going to take notes on my phone. And I just, and I thought, so the whole class, he's literally just sit, sat there hunched over tapping into his phone, I thought to myself, we haven't taught you to engage. We haven't taught you how to engage. You haven't understood that this is a place, this is a safe space. And so to that end, we've always got to get students involved in shaping the classroom. 
get them involved in helping others to put away their phones, into physically moving the classroom around, into asking each other questions. In many ways, these are scary times. In many ways, I, I, say, I say you have to come to terms with my feelings because it does frustrate me how unprepared students have come to engage in the classroom or in, in other ways, what I say is how prepared they are in the face-to-face -face or an online environment to be passive. You know, I've had students who show up to, a, to an online class in their pajamas, in their bed, they're just sitting there. You know, one time, I don't know if there's a student who didn't care that he had left on his camera or not, but he literally just sat there, the whole class is hunched over in his bed, like munching on popcorn. And, you know, it's like he didn't expect that he would have anything to say, that he just came there to passively consume the class like he was watching Netflix. And it was so insulting to everything that was going on. Him, his parents, I just thought to myself, if your parents are in the other room, w would they approve of you going to class like that, sitting there in your pajamas, leaned over, hunched in your bed? And I, as I'm taking my time here because it, it genuinely upset me. I, th I thought, how dare you be just dis so disrespectful to you, to the effort your parents have made in getting you to this classroom, to the effort you can see that, that your educators have put into creating the material and to making it at least interesting, accessible to your classmates. And so rather than going off on the student, especially in an online environment where if you want to be serious and say, hey, do some disciplining, you don't also have the opportunity, unless you're really careful, to, to comfort them and say, listen, I'm going to let you know that this is messed up, but I'm not saying this to chastise, this, chastise you or exclude you. And so there are many ways that we need to think about getting students involved in shaping the physical online environment, what goes on, how we get them to engage, to be present, and accepting the fact that this may be very new to them. I'd love to hear your tips. I'd love to hear other ways that you guys are thinking about this. I'd love to hear from those who've also leaned into it and they appreciate that there's the, the less pressure to have to be physically beautiful and exciting and, and you know, to, to, to be that sort of lecture platform. Maybe there are others who found that this is a, a better way to get different kinds of students involved. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Bye.